Okay, so let's move on to macro. Uh, the, this, the, the point really is that everything that we've said that Antonio has just been saying is that the students are really ready for modern macro. So what's modern macro? It's all about heterogeneous agents where those agents or actors of firms, employees, lenders, borrowers, banks, the central bank, all making purposeful decisions. And the way we get students to do economics is to think, put themselves in the shoes of each of these actors and think about making a, a, making a decision. Um, I'm just going to go through fairly quickly just to kind of orient people who are uh, teaching macro. So growth is taught very much uh, in, in the spirit of both endogenous technological progress and endogenous growth. Uh, the units one and two set the scene for that, so unit two is a, is a model of uh, innovation in response to Schumpeterian rents. So that's the, the, the story of the hockey stick. Um, this is taken up again in unit 16 at the end of the sort of macro sequence, which, which goes sort of short run, medium run, long run. And then in the capstone unit 20, 21 on innovation um, uh, again. So productivity growth arises from investment decisions taken in response to dy dynamic rents. Uh, in the way we teach, the actors who make savings and business investment decisions are not the same people. Okay, so we, we separate the decisions of firms and households. And so we don't uh, in core teach the solo model. Um, that model obviously being one in which savings are automatically invested and with exogenous technological progress. So there are kind of two reasons for not teaching solo, but I think that the solo model is a case where it's pretty easy to teach it. So if someone really wants to teach the solo model in a first year course, um, students are very uh, au fait with the production function. Uh, so it's kind of, the solo model is sort of just geometry and, uh, and you, can pretty, you can pretty easily uh, add that in. So the, the, uh, in that case, I don't think there's any particular reason, although it's good to highlight this question about who's making the savings and investment decisions and problematize the issue of whether uh, savings are automatically invested. So the second aspect of macro that always causes a lot of discussion is how money is handled. Uh, so money banks and financial instability are covered in units 10, 11, and uh, 17, most prominently. Money's endogenous, so there's no uh, little story about people putting money in a piggy bank, bank or whatever, and, uh, and the banking multiplier uh, operating. It's banks that create money by making loans, so that's again taught from the very beginning. The central bank sets the interest rate, and financial stability can arise from debt-driven housing bubbles. So all of that is taught in uh, units 10 and 11. And then it really comes into play um, in the applications in unit 17 and the 100 years of um, macroeconomics. The third element is the labor and product markets. So we teach uh, the uh, the wage setting price setting model um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that business cycles inflation and macroeconomic policy they're in unit 9 13 to 15 and again 17 so 17 is a is a really fantastic capstone in the sense that when you go through this hundred years of, of macroeconomic history you pull in the models that the students have learned and there's this enormous sense of satisfaction uh, on the part of students seeing that they can really put those models into play in really existing big uh, changes in the macro economy. Uh, so we, we develop a unified model of forward-looking actors in a world of limited information and incomplete contracts. So it's really modern micro meets modern macro. 
and uh, I think the an, an unusual aspect of what we do is that we provide direct links to inequality so that we actually derive uh, Lorenz curves um, from the macro model so that we're in a position to study changes in inequality arising from macroeconomic um, developments. The inflation stabilizing unemployment is the Nash equilibrium of the labor market or the labor and product market. Um, uh, we don't have a, ever have full employment, so this is very much a Shapiro Stiglitz uh, approach using wage and price setting curves. Cyclical unemployment is Blanchard Kiyotaki plus Stiglitz. Um, we have aggregate demand based fluctuations around structural unemployment. So it's again the way that uh, if, you, if you go to a central bank and ask them how they think about how the world works, then this is pretty much what they'll tell you. The, it's a bargaining gap based Phillips curve derived directly from the wage and price setting curves. Um, and I'll show you the pictures that we use, the diagrams that we use for that. Oops, hang on, that's the last. Yeah, so macroeconomic policy is uh, centered on a goal-oriented central bank that responds to deviations from its inflation target using the in interest rate to affect aggregate demand. And as we're thinking now of, of, uh, up of the next version, this project never seems to stop, so the 2.0 version, then we're thinking of how, how we teach macroeconomics in a world with where we seem to be for a very long period of time at the zero lower bound. So this neat separation between fiscal and monetary policy that, that's kind of ruled in uh, um, from the 1990s uh, seems to, but we need to, to move on from that uh, to teach students how to think about the, the macro constraints now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so this is the, this is the other issue. We still have countries where hyperinflation is a threat. Uh, we have devaluations generating um, rapid inflation. The model that we teach is very well suited to talk about uh, inflation being generated through devaluation. It's not well suited for teaching about hyperinflation because we have a central bank able to control aggregate demand and pull inflation back towards target. So this seems a really good case for developing a core insight to, to deal with hyperinflation. So that's something we'll, we'll take up. Um, the, the basic macro model is now uh, the way Blanchard teaches. Um, it's the way that uh, I've, uh, with David Soskis, developed in three different macro books for a long time now, but it's now been, take, been taken up as macro books are finally kind of revised. Everything is tied to the micro foundations, wage setting, price setting, credit constraints and consumption smoothing, uh, coordination gain based investment behavior and bank behavior. So all of the actors have been introduced with behavior that we're going to use for the aggregate economy. So uh, it, it's a pretty smooth transition. This is a slide I give to my students. So these are again the students who've done uh, macroeconomics uh, or hear their friends at other universities talking about the macro models that they're learning. So I explain to them why not use the labor market model with supply and demand curves that cross? Why don't we use ADAS? Why don't we use the ISLM model? So there's a kind of reasoned explanation and uh, students who are interested are, uh, are seem pretty satisfied with, with this. So the payoff, as I've said, integrates inequality, illuminates uh, economic history, um, and we're, we've, we've not got a huge amount of time, but I just want to kind of sketch the elements that go into the aggregate model. Crucial is uh, in, in, imperfect information, so asymmetric information uh, is absolutely crucial in lying behind the incomplete contracts in, in the labour market. 
So the fact that contracts over effort uh, can't be made, it's impossible to verify, is what gives us the, uh, the principal agent problem in the, uh, in the labour market and the model of efficiency wages that we teach. So we talk to the students about what the conflict is over, what's left out of the contract. People say, well, how can you possibly do this with, with beginning first year students? The answer is, which I'm sure you found, is very easy. Every student in front of you has had a job. Maybe they've even only done babysitting. They at least know people with jobs, and they know that there's no complete uh, contract in, in the labour market. So they have an in instinctive sense about efficiency wages uh, from their everyday experience. And uh, this, is, this is something that you, you definitely not have a problem with. So this is the way we teach it. I'm not going to go through the 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 step by step. I'm showing you the step by step because that's what students can do in the ebook, right? So that every model is set out like this, where you click through it. There's a commentary beneath, uh, so it's it's like an animated PowerPoint like this, um, but in uh, set out in the ebook. So this is. The, the worker's best response function, this is the feasible set, this is how the wage is set at minimum feasible cost here, so this is the constrained optimization solution in this wage effort setting, and then we show how the best response function shifts in response to changes in aggregate unemployment and then immediately you see, okay, aggregate unemployment, this is going to help us link straight to the macroeconomy. Equally, how it responds in, in, in uh, response to changes in unemployment benefit, so this just shifts the, uh, the best response function. How the worker is going to respond in terms of effort to any wage offered by the employer. It's in the discussions in India last week, it, it became clear that it was actually pretty easy to introduce the informal sector as the fallback for a worker in, uh, working in the formal sector. So if you have an economy where there's a really big informal sector, you don't actually have to introduce, you don't either have to ignore it entirely when you're uh, working through the macro model, nor do you have to introduce a two-sector model, which is a step too far. You can simply have a kind of budget version um, where you introduce the informal sector as the, uh, the fallback position of the worker. So it's just playing this role here uh, in terms of the reservation wage. It's going to be just determined by what the opportunities are in the informal sector. And I think that should be attractive for the context in which many of you are teaching. This is a nice example of uh, how do we bring this question about incomplete contracts and effort uh, to the data. This is a paper by Ed Lazia on uh, using data from the financial crisis on why workers speed up when the economy slows down. And you can see just by looking at this exercise, so this is in the sixth week of the term, six weeks into doing their first course in economics, they're asked to draw the best response diagram to sketch the results found by Lazia in their study. So they read this section here. They have to draw the best response function uh, and explain what it illustrates for the pre-crisis period, the crisis years, and the post-crisis years, assuming the employer doesn't adjust the wage. And then, it re uh, so we're always asking them, is this a good model? So then go back and think about why the firm might not cut wages in a recession. So this is uh, an exercise. We get the students to do it. They, they, uh, they do pretty well. The great thing that we can do is, once we've set the model up of the wage setting firm with the, with the best response function, is that we, since we show that the best response function shifts at higher unemployment shifts the best response function to the left, so the firm sets a lower wage, 
and we can just translate this directly into the aggregate economy with employment here, the real wage here, and we get an upward sloping wage curve. So that's going directly from the, the micro, the firm, the interaction between the worker and the firm as the wage is set, noting that that's going to be affected by aggregate unemployment, and then we get the, the wage setting curve. Oops. So that's a classic case of micro, macro data. Micro, macro, and then this is data on the wage curve from the US. This is just a summary, same thing again. Firm level, aggregate level. I just showed you this slide so that we can just then do the product market. Right, so you just think, well, it's just the same thing. Looks the same. This is the model Antonio just taught. Okay, so this is the firm setting the price. These are the ISO profit curves. This is the demand curve. Bringing the aggregate economy by this shift in the demand curve, so a proportionate change in the demand facing the firm as a result of a business cycle upswing, for example. The price stays the same, the firm employs more workers to produce more output, and that gives you the, uh, the price setting curve at the aggregate level. And this is the markup. We can answer questions like, why was unemployment higher in Spain than in Germany, structural unemployment, using this model, by looking at the data for the unemployment rate, that's what we're trying to explain, the variables in the model, generosity of unemployment benefits, uh, an indication of the markup by the openness of the economy to global competition, and uh, labour productivity. So we can map each of those to the, uh, to the, to the model and we'll get a, a prediction. This is Germany here with low unemployment, high real wages, and Spain with high unemployment and lower real wages. So, uh, and then we go back and look at the data. I, I said that, sorry? Yeah, we should stop. Yeah. Uh, this is the, the distribution of income, so showing that how we can, we can tie the labour market model directly to the Lorenz curve. So this is the unemployed here, there are 10 of them. These are the employed, these are the owners, using the data from here on unemployment, 10 of them here. This is the profit share, so we can map directly from the macro model look at the, uh, the Lorenz curve and then implement policy changes. So a policy change that changes unemployment is going to shift this intercept for the Lorenz curve. Uh, a change in competition, which is going to shift the price setting curve, is going to shift this point on the Lorenz curve. You can get them to calculate Gini coefficients as well as drawing Lorenz curves. Okay, so we're supposed to be finishing at 45? Four. 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 At six. Okay. Four. Four. Yeah, okay, great. So just let me um, uh, just mention this is pretty straightforward. The second principal agent problem is the lenders and borrowers, so the credit market. You can see again, we do everything in a systematic way. So who are the actors? This is the labor market, this is the credit market. What's the conflict of interest over? The enforceable contract covers some things, but not others, so what's left out of the contract, uh, contract and therefore, what's, what's the result? So here we had involuntary unemployment, here we have credit constraints. Once we have credit constraints, then we can move directly onto Unit 13, which is economic fluctuations and unemployment. Oops, and uh, because they've been through the credit market, they understand the motivation for consumption smoothing, 
from Unit 4, they understand a coordination game, so they're really well able to answer these two questions. Why is consumption smooth and why is investment volatile? We get them to look at the data, they do some data exercises, and they, whatever country they, they choose, they will indeed find that consumption is smoother than investment. So this is a kind of great way of reinforcing their, um, their satisfaction that they're learning something. Unemployment uh, and fiscal policy, uh, we reinstated the Keynesian cross, which kind of had been lost from principles teaching. Uh, why do we do it? Because it, it is a dynamic model, it's, it has the, the action is all there. It's a very good way of teaching students the difference between an equilibrium condition and an accounting identity, which I think is otherwise a very kind of abstract concept, but you can do it very nicely using the, um, the Keynesian cross diagram. So we use that. Here's inflation, unemployment and monetary policy. Uh, the data, what happened to the Phillips curve, again, they click through and see these, first of all, they just see the scatter of all these data points, which is the first figure here, and then as they click through, the periods appear, so you get Phillips curves, um, but not a stable Phillips curve emerging. The theory, we derive the Phillips curve directly from the wage setting and price setting curve, so it, uh, it is easily um, uh, derived. And then we've got the model. This is the, the labor and the product market. This is the Phillips curve. And this is the, uh, the, the, the Keynesian cross. So as you flick through the, the panels here, you see the economy going from boom, inflation going up, because of the opening up of this bargaining gap. As the economy moves to bust, uh, the, you get a negative bargaining gap here generated by the, uh, the firm having to pay lower wages, right back to the best response function. So the, the model is, once they get the hang of it, they get the hang of it much better because they can click through these panels, then they have a pretty satisfying understanding of business cycles and inflation. We can do things like uh, asking questions like why is inflation falling, could be stronger competition, could be weaker insiders, could be a business cycle explanation. Look at an increase in the degree of competition and look at what it does to inequality. Think of the data now showing decreases in competition, increases in markups, and you'll see the gene coefficient increasing. This is the opposite case. The other, finally, the, the last actor, government central bank as actors, same setup. Uh, so this is the, uh, the feasible steps, the Phillips curve. These are the loss functions of the central bank. This is the Keynesian cross and you can see how an uh, interest rate, uh, an inflation rate targeting central bank is going to use the interest rate to shift the aggregate demand curve to get back to its uh, inflation target. So this is also discussed in a blog. As I mentioned, we can do a blog on intermediate courses. This is a blog on cause model of inflation. That's it.